Okay. All righty. So Dr. Bridget Glazeroff is an award-winning general and cosmetic dentist, women's health advocate, and motivational speaker. She completed her dental education at NYU School of Dentistry and was chief general practice resident at NY Presbyterian Methodist Hospital. Dr. Bridget was diagnosed, battled, and is a survivor of stage three breast cancer at age 26, and is now an advocate for early testing, patient rights, and ambassador for multiple breast cancer organizations. She lectures dental students nationwide on how to position themselves for success while managing their health and lifestyle. Please help me welcome Dr. Bridget. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Diana, for such a beautiful introduction. And I wanted to thank you girls and everyone else that's part of ASDA for putting this together this weekend. I think that this has been an amazing weekend of so many lectures. I've been kind of popping in here and there wanting to hear everything that you guys are listening to so that I could be able to wrap it up nicely for you. Um, there are a few familiar faces because I have lectured at a few schools, which is how I know Diana and a few of the other students here. So you might be hearing a few things that I have talked about before. But um, overall, I think that this is going to be a nice eye-opening experience for everyone in dental school. So I'm going to be talking to you guys about how to survive and thrive in dental school, but it's going to be coming from a different perspective after everything that I've been through over the past few years. So we'll get into it. Give me a second. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry guys. Okay. I think it's working now. All right. So before we get going, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of information about myself so that you can get to know me a little bit better. And if the slides would work, that would just be fabulous. What are you pressing? Okay. Here we go. So I'm originally from New York, born and raised in New York. I went to college at Staten Island University College and I went there for two and a half years. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in two and a half years. That's how crazy I was to finish early and get into dental school as fast as I can. So I majored in bio and I had um, a minor in chemistry. I went straight to NYU and graduated in 2016. From there, I did my general residency at NYP, which was then called Brooklyn Methodist. And I ended up staying on for a second year. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about why I think that the second year of residency is extremely important, especially right now with the crazy world, with COVID that we're living in, we can really take advantage of the time and opportunity that we have in learning and taking the second year for yourselves. I am very passionate about continuing education. I absolutely love going to CE courses. I haven't traveled at all during COVID and the first time that I'll be going on a plane will be next month for a two week course in Seattle. So normal people go on vacation and I'm going to learn about teeth, but it's all for the greater good. So I absolutely love CE. I will talk to you guys about some of my favorite CE courses that you can do right now as dental students that are actually not so expensive and things you could do to kind of sharpen up your hand skills starting now instead of thinking, oh my God, it's COVID. We're not in clinic. I'm not doing anything. I'm not getting any better because there are so many ways to continually better yourself. So I'm going to give you guys some tips and pointers of CE that I think would be extremely helpful. Um, like Diana said, I also was diagnosed with breast cancer at an early age when I was in my second year of residency. And that's kind of what changed my whole entire life and perspective on how I see dentistry, how I approach my patients, how I approach work-life balance in general, which is very, very different than the way that I used to. So I'll tell you guys how I used to do it, what it took for me to realize that it was completely wrong and why I want to educate and help spread the word that that is the wrong way to do it. Cause I know that many people are doing it the way that I did, which is killing yourself, bending over backwards for the grades, not giving yourself even a moment to breathe. And if I was able to go back to dental school today, I would do it very differently. Um, just a few other little things about me. I absolutely love to eat. Even though if you follow me on Instagram, I'm always working out and I'm always on a diet. I am always cheating cause I love to eat. Um, I love planning events and I'm very, very into fashion. Um, right now I work on the Upper East Side in New York at a practice called LaBelle's. And I wanted to tell you guys how I ended up working at this practice because from young, younger dentists, like newer dentists, everyone is always asking me, how did I end up working at such a practice in New York? So I will tell you guys how that happened. And one of the, um, one of the 
very important things about social media today. And again, something that could be started right now in dental school. So the way that I started off my career, like I had told you, was that I was running ahead of the bus. I went to college and graduated with my bio degree in two and a half years. I took like 30 credits a semester, took classes all summer, all winter, and there was absolutely no stopping me. I don't think I slept for two and a half years to finish this degree. Then after dental school, I started my residency. And after the first year of residency, I decided to stay on a second year because a few of my mentors who are very important people to me told me that education is number one in dentistry and one more year will not change anything. And it is 150% true. So this was my schedule that we're looking at as my chief year. So I had convinced my residency director that I did not want to, I could only stay if I worked in the clinic Monday through Thursday, because Friday was reserved to do a full mouth rehab course at NYU. So Monday through Thursday, I went to residency. Wednesday mornings before residency, because it started in the afternoon, I also worked in private practice. Friday all day long, I was at NYU doing the full mouth rehab course, and Saturday and Sunday, I worked in private practice. As you can see, this is a psychotic schedule. And back then, I did not understand that this is abnormal. I was like, I am fearless. There's nothing stopping me. I'm young. I'm healthy. Literally, nothing can come in my way. And so this is how we continued until um, about two months before the residency came to an end, and I then found out that I was being diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. So this is the point in my life that everything came crashing down and this is what changed it all. I feel like everyone that you speak to, everyone has a story and everyone has their own version of what changes their lives. It could be small, it could be big. For me, obviously this was the life-changing moment. And you would think that someone who got diagnosed with breast cancer, who had to stop their life and go for treatment, that the aha moment would come right away, but it actually didn't. Because what happened was I had to leave my residency program because it wasn't safe for me with my low immune system to be at the hospital. So instead of not working at all, I said, hey, this is a great opportunity for me to work more in the private practice. Great. So during chemo and all of that fun stuff, I was working in a private practice, building up my own patient pool. Because from the get-go, I always wanted to have my own practice. So I was basically in a situation where I was almost like renting a chair in a private practice and just starting off slow bringing, you know, doing my own marketing, bringing in my own patients. And I thought it was a good opportunity for me to do all of that while I was going through chemo, primo advice. Um, and then when everything became a little bit too difficult and I could no longer work, I had to stop working for about six months so that I could finish my treatment and have surgery. During that time, I felt horrible, not only physically, but mentally because I wasn't able to work. And I felt like I wasn't furthering myself in my career. I wasn't getting any better. Um, and I just felt horrible about myself and I didn't understand why for a very long time. So the moment that I finished my radiation and I was kind of cleared to go back to work was the moment that I went to work immediately. And only between that and maybe like a few months later, did I realize that I could no longer handle the schedule that I was doing before and why it was extremely, extremely toxic. And that's when I started making small shifts to incorporate wellness into my life because it took me getting sick, not being able to work, and then coming back to work to realize that I have, put, I have placed all the value of myself as a human being in my dentistry. And when I could not work for those six months, the reason I felt kind of useless was because who I was was dentistry, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, seven days a week for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I, it was as if there was nothing else that I could offer to the universe other than the fact that I like dentistry. So reframing that mindset was very, very difficult. And I can tell you that even today, it's something that I'm constantly, constantly working on to grow as a practitioner and as a person. So the advice that I'm gonna give you now is after all of these aha moments and what I realized about dentistry and about life and how I was living in a very, very, very toxic experience in dental school and residency. And I don't want anyone here to do that to themselves, to think that this is the only way to be successful, that this is the only way to do well, this go, go, go attitude. Um, I realized that what I did for myself was make dental school toxic. And I'm sure that plenty of other people do the same thing because every night I would go to sleep thinking, did I do enough today? Did I study enough? Am I part of enough clubs? Will I make it into residency? Will I get into specialty and blah, 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 blah? Because that is how we're kind of programmed to think. We're in this environment where everyone else is doing the same thing. So how are you going to one-up the other person? And it's like the eyes are wandering. We're looking at everyone. And it's natural. As much as, you know, I would think, oh, I'm doing my own thing. I'm not listening to anyone. It's very natural to kind of look around at your peers and see what everyone else is doing and then have that 
like inflict upon you and what you want to do. So we all know dental school is difficult enough as it is. You feel burned out after D1 and then it's like, oh my God, there's three years left to go. How are we going to do this? Um, I went to NYU. I don't know if there's any NYU students here. I think that the environment is extremely competitive. You know, I remember that even when we were applying to residency, people didn't want to tell each other what residency they were applying into because they think that someone else might take their spot. You're getting so much information. You take exams for one test and I'm sorry, you're taking exams for one class while you're studying for another. And you have no idea. I remember in, in NYU, there were so many classes in one semester. I completely had no idea what was going on in the semester because things would start and end one month and then another. And then it's like you took 55 courses in one semester and my brain would be constantly spinning. So you're overstimulated, exhausted. Your nervous system is in overdrive and there is no possible healthy way to live. And that is what I was doing. I wasn't living normally. My attitude was just don't sleep, don't eat. There's no time to see your family. There's no extra time to see your friends because then you won't get into residency and then you won't be the best dentist in the world. And I think I went to sleep like that every single day for four years, which is extremely, extremely stressful. So that being said, I want to pull up a few questions, poll questions, just as a fun little experiment to see how everyone else is doing in dental school. I didn't graduate that long ago. I graduated in 2016, but that being said, um, I don't know if things have changed much in the last few years. So let's do the questions and see what happens. Michelle, we're giving people a few minutes and you're gonna put it up. Yeah, sounds great. We're at like 50% in right now. So I'll get it up to 70 and then we'll stop. Sounds good. Okay. So 50% of people have pulled an all-nighter and 50% didn't, and I applaud those who have not, so good for you. One to two all-nighters, three to five. It seems like one to two, zero is 50%. Have you ever missed a family occasion? Ah, uh, 83% have said yes. Have you sacrificed relationships? 70%. So I can tell you right now that this is definitely not a normal number, and I did the exact same thing. I didn't go see my family. I definitely sacrificed relationships with my friends. And I can tell you right now that absolutely none of it is worth it because going to see your family is much more important than taking a few hours to study because nothing about your career will change. I know it seems like when you're in dental school that this is the most important thing in the world. And every moment that you miss something can take away from your career. But the big, the big picture of it is that this is just such a small piece of your bigger career. And it is only the stepping stone to where you're going to be. So if we miss everything now, if we miss all the family occasions, we sacrifice all of our relationships, this is how you're going to start out your professional career, not even understanding how to balance the people in your life. And what I can tell you is that dental school is hard, but being out in the real world is harder in a different kind of way. And you need the support of your friends and your family. I can tell you that I would not be able to be where I am without the support of my friends and family. And if we constantly don't show up for them by missing everything, they will not show up for you. And that's a hundred percent fact. So even though it seems that way that you have to stay up all night, you can't see your family, taking an hour off will not change your grade. It won't change your grade. You won't fail the test. And even if you do, it still doesn't matter. The world will still not end because school doesn't just kick you out like that. Even if you fail one thing, they give you a more opportunity. You could take the test again. You could remediate the course. Oh God, if God forbid you have to, and still the world will keep turning. There are plenty of people that I know that had to even remediate courses at NYU and they're still great dentists and everyone is doing fabulously. So all these little things that we think are extremely important are not. So I would like to encourage everyone that if you're faced in a position where you can see your family for one hour versus studying for an exam, I would take the other and see the family. Um, like I said, I never did any of this. I never saw my family. I put everyone last and I only put school first. And I drove myself to this mentality that I could do it all. And the thing that starts happening is that everyone then expects it from you. So that will bring me to my next 
slide, which is something that this is a quote that's going to come up that I really, really, really love. And this quote is by my life coach, Masha, who a few, a few people here actually know her. So when I went back to work after being sick, I started back as if nothing ever happened. And then I was extremely run down and I realized that I could no longer live that way. I was not feeling well physically. I was not feeling well mentally. And it took me a really long time to realize that I can no longer run at that pace seven days a week, but everyone still expected it of me because this is, the, this is how I presented myself. I'm Dr. Bridget and I don't need any time to rest and I don't need a break. And if you want me to work an extra day, I will. And if the patient can't come on this day, I'll bend over backwards and I'll come on that day. And what happens is no one expects anything otherwise of you. So what happened was I went back to work and now all of a sudden, I need to work extra. People want me to do more. And I say, yes, yes, yes to absolutely everything. And then I'm sick physically and mentally, and I don't feel good. And then what happens is the moment that you start saying, you know what? I don't think I could do this. The other person says, what do you mean? You've been doing this for so long. You've been doing this for years. Why all of a sudden can't you do this? And I realized that I did not have any type of healthy boundaries between myself and my workplace. I said yes to everything. And if the patient couldn't come on my time, then I came on their time. And that is a horrible way to start practicing because you will be taken advantage of as a clinician, especially when you are working as an associate. Because when you own your own practice and you make your own schedule, that is one thing. But when you work under someone else's roof and the moment you say yes to everything, that will be your life seven days a week. And it it took me a while to kind of reframe that in my own head so that I could set the boundary to let everyone else know that this is not okay with me. I won't be able to work this way. And I even had like, you have this mentality. It goes beyond the workplace. It goes into the patients because when patients start seeing that they can kind of take advantage of you and they could call you at midnight and doing all those kind of things, they start and they don't stop. And I kind of was that person. You wanted to call me at midnight because your tooth hurt. I was there, but now that is no longer a thing. So working with my life coach, Masha, and when she told me this quote, it really was just like eye-opening experience because I called her about a situation at work and I was like, I don't understand why I'm being treated like this. And she's like, what do you mean you don't understand? You allow yourself to be treated like this every single day. And it never clicked in my head that I was the one doing this. So that is when the setting of boundaries became a part of my life in work and within my, in my relationship, in my family, with my husband, and put, being able to put yourself first in your needs. It's a complete reframe of your mindset to understand what you need. Because I feel like me personally, when I was constantly going, I never really knew what it was that I needed because I had no time to think about it. My main concern was satisfying everyone else around me and putting myself last. So this is when I started to work with my life coach. And I really just love this quote so much. If you can take a picture of it, you should. And if you ever feel like you're in a situation where someone's not treating you right and you don't understand why, think about what's going on around you and if you put yourself in this position. So the ability to say no is difficult, but it gives you your own self-worth to understand what it is that you need. Whew. So that was a mouthful. We are all going to take a deep breath. And now I'm actually going to give you, yes, let's all take a deep breath. Woo. And we are now going to talk about some tips of how to succeed in dental school, but to also stay healthy and sane while we are doing it. Now, if I could go back to dental school, what I could tell you that I would do is focus my number one effort into building relationships. Because when you get out, everything in life is about who you know whether it's the job that you're gonna get, or when you have a patient who has an emergency and you need to call your specialist friend at midnight and you want them to pick up the phone on you, or who is going to be your business partner when you decide to open up a practice. In general, everything in life is about relationships. So even though in dental school, it may feel like you're fending for yourself because everybody wants to be the best dentist, the beauty and reality of it is that you can't be the best without having everyone around you be the best too. So even if you are quote unquote competing with the person next to you to be, to get into residency or whatever else that you want to do, you guys collectively would not be able to do it without each other. So going back, building relationships with your peers and your patients is the number one thing that I could tell you. Collaborating with those that are next to you and you guys are doing a great job at it. Like I 
I know that Michelle, for example, and Diana have worked together so well with everyone else who put this together. I'm just saying from my own experience, I don't think I saw this so much within my own class, which is why I think it's important. Um, making your own decisions with confidence and not really paying attention to what everyone else is doing around you. I know it's very easy to look left and right in school and think, oh my God, but this girl's in seven clubs and I'm in five. Now I'm not gonna make it. It's very easy to get caught into that. But what I will encourage you to do is to make your own decisions and be confident that whatever is meant for you will be for you. So if your friend asks you what residency you're applying to and why, tell them. Don't think that if you tell them about your residency, now they're gonna like it and they're gonna wanna apply there and now that spot is no longer yours because the spot that belongs to you will be for you and the spot that belongs to them will be for them. You telling them where you wanna go and what you wanna do will not change your life in any kind of way. And last but not least, we're going to talk about a few things of how to incorporate wellness practices. I know it sounds a little crazy because it's like, oh, I have absolutely no time, I'm in school. And believe you me that when I was in school, I didn't incorporate any wellness practices. I don't think I even ate for four years. So it might sound a little like, how am I gonna do this? But we will talk about just a few little ways that we can incorporate this into our daily lives. And especially now with COVID, you are in school less and you are home more. So instead of looking at it as this negative, like, oh my God, I'm, I'm not in school, I'm not drooling, I'm gonna suck, blah, blah, blah. Instead, you should be so grateful that you have this opportunity. Like, wow, I'm home. Now I can actually eat or I can take this time for myself. And we should have just reframed the mindset. Everything is about reframing your mindset so that we can get to success without killing ourselves. So focusing on building relationships, this is just a picture of me and my best friend. Um, and we met in dental school and I can tell you that we would both would not make it without each other. I would help her in some ways, she would help me in other ways. And finding someone that is even opposite of you is kind of the best thing that you can do because you'll be there for each other in different ways. But what, what, I, what I also wanna say about building relationships relationships other than with your friends is with your patients. I always say this, you are a dentist treating patients and not a professional student taking tests. You will not be taking tests for the rest of your life. Your career and your success of your career will come from the relationships that you build with your patients. It won't even be from the skill of how you are as a clinician. Of course, being an amazing clinician is top, but what you have to understand is that with patients, they have no idea what's going on. They don't know how many CE courses you took to do the best DO in the world, right? Class two composite. What they know is how you made them feel when they sat in the chair. And we all know that everyone is scared of the dentist. You hear it all the time. You hear it from your friends. You see it with the patients that come to clinic. The first thing they do when they sit down is, I'm sorry, you seem great, but I hate the dentist. I just hate being here. What are we going to do today? So if you want to build good relationships with your patients, you have to establish trust. And I think that one of the issues in school is that they don't push that. In school, it's requirements. We need five root canals, we need seven RPDs and 10 crowns. And then the moment the patient sits in your chair, in your head, you see this patient as, oh, this is my RPD. This is my RPD and this is what I need to do to graduate. Instead of seeing it as, wow, this is Mr. Jones. He lost his teeth in this accident. Now I'm gonna help him get his teeth back so he could get his life back. And we're programmed to thinking that this human being is an RPD, which they are not. They are a person who is in your chair for you to help them. And this mentality of these requirements, I feel like it also translates into the workplace as a professional as goals. So when you start working as an associate or when you have your own practice, at the end of the day, dentistry is also a business. And when you start working in this business, it's gonna be goals to meet. So if you're so programmed as seeing patients as requirements, when you get to the workplace, you're gonna see them as goals to meet for the day. Oh, this is the goal for the day. And I can tell you that that is not a way to be successful. I don't ever, I don't believe in selling dentistry ever. When people ask me like, oh, how do you do these cases? What do you do to sell? My answer is simple, nothing. I don't sell. I com communicate with my patient. We have a general understanding of what's going on. And I give them my honest opinion about what I want to do. And when you establish that relationship and that trust, the patient will do what you say. And they are really not going to be questioning you because that foundation is very strong. There are plenty of doctors that other people go to other than dentists. And it's kind of a different relationship because they are not in their mouth. The mouth is a very shameful place for many people. And once you are able to kind of establish that relationship with the patient, they trust you. And even if you move to a different state, they will follow you. They will follow you, follow you, follow you because that relationship is intimate. It's very intimate between doctor and patient. So 
when you get to clinic, don't think about the patient as your requirement for the root canal. Think about them as, wow, I have an opportunity to learn how to speak with the patient, to know how to get them comfortable, to create this relationship with them. And that's what I'm going to take with me to private practice. Always remember that because when you get out of here, you're not taking tests and you're not really studying. You're going to go learn CE because you want to, not because you have to. Um, so sharing, collaborating, success will not come from competition. And I can tell you that for sure, that you will be more successful by working with others and helping with others. You don't know if the person sitting next to you is going to be your business partner, a specialist that you need to, or literally your bridesmaid at your wedding, like my best friend in this picture that I showed you guys. So don't hide what you're planning and studying for. It will not change the course of action for your life. 150%. Do share your notes, help each other, let each other know when you're needing a hand. Because the thing is that when you're vulnerable and you help that person, when you need help, they'll be there for you. If everyone has their guard up all the time and no one is helping each other, how, where, where are we going with this? Everyone's in dental school for one reason, to be a clinician, to help others with their oral health care. And this is a collective goal. You're all there for one reason, right? You didn't enter dental school thinking, wow, I want to go to dental school so that I could just be the best and compete with everyone else. And no one else is going to be as good as me, right? We went to school with this mindset of, wow, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a clinician. I want to help others, but so does everyone else. So imagine if you guys all put that energy together to do that for, for your patients together, it will be much, much better for everybody. And again, Finding a friend, even if they're your opposite, will balance you out and it's gonna be much easier for everyone to get through school. This picture is a picture of me and Dr. Wang who owns LaBelle's, which, I work, which is the office I work in. And I'm gonna get into it a little bit about how we got into there, how I got to start working in this practice. And I realized that I don't feel like I have as much time left because I'm talking a lot. So I'm gonna to try to speed it up. All right, so let's incorporate some wellness practices that I think are easy little things that we could do. Taking an hour a day for yourself. No studying, no, no Zoom, nothing that has to do with dentistry at all. Just one hour a day, whether that be to work out, to listen to music, to watch a TV show, anything at all, this one hour a day won't change your grades, but it can elevate your mood into such a higher place that you'll be able to do the rest of the things that you wanna do better. So if you wake up in the morning and you are able to take an hour for yourself to just enjoy your breakfast, enjoy your coffee, maybe jot down a few things that you want to do for the day or goals for the day, your mindset will be much more prepared to take on the day. Now, the next thing, which I still struggle with, is to make shorter to-do lists. Do not write a list of 50 things to do in one day because you will not get them done. You won't. And what's going to happen is you're going to write 50 things. You're going to check off three. And at the end of the day, when you look at the list, you're not going to look at those three and think, wow, look, I did three so well. You're going to look at the 47 and say, oh my God, I suck. I didn't do 47 things. So that again, well, instead of being happy of what you did, you're going to think, wow, I didn't accomplish anything today. So make the to-do lists actually doable. So when I do this on Sunday and I'm like, wow, this is what I need to do for the week. I put it into my Google calendar. And then when I look at it, if I know realistically, there is no way in hell I'm getting this done, I move it. This will be done on Monday and this will be done on Tuesday. Cause when I look at my to-do list for the day and I'm done, I think, wow, look at what I accomplished. I did what I wanted to do. And I don't even think about the other things until the next day comes into play. And I think it's a huge difference on my, on my mental state. So this is why I recommend doing that. Be honest with yourself about what you actually can get done. And when you do get it, something done that you're proud of, write it down. Write it down and be proud of yourself because the, who, who else is it that we're waiting to be proud of us? Is it you that's looking for external validation or do you want to be proud of yourself? So if we write down the things that we're doing that are actually good, again, you will elevate your mood. At the end of the day, figure out why you're doing the things that you're doing. Are you doing them for you to be happy or are we waiting for external validation? And that's something to think about when you're writing down your wins of the day. When I brush my teeth in the morning, I set my intention for the day. You have two minutes. Your electric toothbrush is spinning for two minutes and I set my intention for the day. What do I want to get done today? What I'm thankful for. It sounds like a funny little practice, but again, as I leave the house, I know what I'm grateful for and I know what my intention is for the day. Because when you are aligned with your thoughts and what you want, manifesting things, you know, the magic that happens, it only happens in that way. When you are extremely stressed and your head is not clear, 
you're not able to accept any of the goodness that's going to come out of the world because your body is just physically not able to accept it. Meditating and journaling. Sounds very woo-woo for many people. They're like, what am I, what, what, what am I going to meditate? Sounds crazy, but I'm just going to encourage you to take 10 minutes of the day, five minutes, three minutes, however many minutes you want, shut everything off and just close your eyes. In the beginning, you might have a bunch of things bouncing up and down, but it will die down and then some clarity will come. You can put on music that you like, some kind of slow music, but that is when I personally do my best thinking. When I'm able to kind of get everything out of my head, not think about all the buzzing things going on and see what it is that I want and how I'm going to get it. Um, we talked about starting seeing your patients as people instead of requirements. I think this is extremely important. Um, and dental school special, create a routine for test taking. The same way that yoga is called a practice, you should create your own practice about how you test take and how you study. And the way that Nick test takes and studies could be very different from from Melissa, from Michelle, from Diana. Everyone has their own way. So don't think that because this one is up all night that you need to be. Everyone has their own way of how they retain information and how they can succeed. Like for me, for example, this huddling around the door before the test with everyone being nervous for three hours never worked for me. So I would go hide in the stairwell because that would stress me out. So just figure out your own test taking way and do it. It doesn't matter that 99% of people are doing it this way and you're doing it that way. That doesn't matter. All right, we're doing a few more questions quickly. Michelle, you're up. When is the last time we did something fun? Three to five days ago. Okay, not so bad. Those of you who said it's been a year, we need to have a serious conversation. Um, have you ever written down your wins? 65% said no. So this is something that we can start doing today. There is no, there's no learning that needs to be done for this. There is no course that needs to be taken. This can be done starting tonight. Have you ever tried to sit with your thoughts? Yes, but infrequently. So these are just a few things that we can get started on today. I want everyone tonight, after this whole beautiful weekend of learning that you had, write down a few of your wins over the past maybe week, starting off the new year strong and positive. What have you done that you are so proud of over the last week? And it doesn't matter if it's as small as I got to work out once and I haven't worked out in six months. Just finish the day by looking at all the good that you did. And I promise you, you will wake up in the morning feeling better. Um, so yeah, try it tonight. Message me, let me know if you feel better and get into this routine because you will start vibrating at a higher frequency and being this whole positive self. You see it, you see people on Instagram doing it. You're like, how is it done? It starts with you. It starts with you changing your mindset. All right, I'm gonna try to move a little faster because I do wanna give a few more tips on residency. And now it's not moving. Dave, help. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about real tips and tricks. So you can take screenshots of the next few because I'm going to try to go through it a little quickly because I know we only have like 10 minutes left. Michelle, let me know when I'm like in trouble. All right. So hacks for applying to residency. You need to show them who you are and that you're interested. I can tell you that with dental school and with residency, I literally applied to one. One school, one residency, and I figured I'll deal with the consequences if it doesn't work out. That's just my personal psychosis, not encouraging it, but that's how confident I was and where I wanted to go and I was gonna get it done no matter what. Showing up right now, yes, I understand, could be a little bit more difficult, but with vaccines and all the hospitals being vaccinated, I do think you'll be able to start showing up sooner. Email them, let them know ahead of time who you are. Why are you gonna make a great fit? Manifest your presence. And right now, even with the interviews that are in, via Zoom, show them who you are. And my most important advice to you is in your personal statement, 
make it personal. I have read personal statements of dental students who are applying and need my help. I read their personal statement and all it is is a paragraph form of what the CV is. We don't need that. We have the CV. We can see all the grades and we can see what you've done. But when a person reads a personal statement, they want to know who you are because they're reading 300 thousand of them, however many, how are they going to remember you? They're going to remember you by being that unique, different person. So when you're on your Zoom or you're at the interview, instead of talking about your grades, tell them what makes you who you are. Do you like to dance? Are you a surfer? Um, are you very into fitness? Because they're not even going to barely remember your name. There are so many names, but they're going to remember, oh, the girl, the girl that loves dancing. Oh, she had such a great personality. Because at the end of the day, your grades are really not going to be that different from someone else, right? everyone's applying, everyone's grades are pretty similar. It's who you are as a person, how you're gonna benefit that program as part of a team is what's gonna get you in there. Because again, being a part of residency, and I can tell you for one, from my residency, it is hard. There's a lot of hospital things that are going on and you need to work together. So I can tell you from my residency, the director is the number one thing for them is how you can operate as a team and show them that, show them your skills, do you work on a committee? What have you done that shows that you are going to be an asset to running how this clinic is going to run? And lastly, understand that GPR, no matter where you go, is not about being a specialist. So going and asking, oh, am I going to place 200 implants this year? The answer is no, you will not. Being in a good GPR means that you're going to be a well-rounded pr practitioner. It's not about going to learn, oh, I just want to go here to do extractions. Or I just want to, I only want to go to this residency because I heard they place a lot of implants. But even if they do, who cares? It's the first year of residency. It's your first year out of school. You need to become a little bit learned in everything, in endo, in pros, in placing implants. You don't even want to go somewhere that's going to just be focusing on one place. Because if you did, then you're going to specialize. The whole point of GPR is to become a general practitioner, not a specialist in implants. So understanding that is why going into it, you will have a better kind of mindset of what you're going to get out of it. A lot of like when I was in my second year and I was in helping interview people coming in for the first year, they're like, well, I want to go to a residency where I'm going to place 100 crowns. Well, you're not going to go to a residency where you're going to place 150 crowns anywhere. I don't care where you go. It's just not going to happen because that is not what general practice residency is about. It's about becoming well-rounded, learning how to treatment plan. And even if you want to be a super general dentist who does all these implants, even though you're not a surgeon, you can be but you won't be able to be successful at it if you don't have the fundamentals and everywhere else. So that's my spiel about residency. Make it personal, be who you are, and let them remember you for who you are as a person, not the accomplishments and the grades on the resume. They can read that without you. All right, crushing residency and post-residency life. Being a team player always will help you in residency. And let's not forget that the majority of people, when you get out of residency, you're not gonna become a solo practitioner. 99% of people are going to work in a group practice as an associate. So learning how to be a team player is going to set you up for success in that environment. Cause I don't know very many people who set up solo practices alone, straight, you know, straight out of the residency. Um, shadowing. Again, something that could be a little bit difficult right now, but without all the dentists getting vaccinated and students, I think that soon enough, you can start shadowing in different practices. CE, milking CE. When you're a resident, you can get so much CE for free. It's absolutely crazy. Just email anything that you want. Tell them you're, a, you're in residency, how interested you are. They will give you a huge discount if not allow you to come for free. Taking pictures. Take pictures of everything that you do. If you can't afford a camera yet, take pictures on your cell phone. Make a CV for yourself of uh, photos. Make a portfolio because you will be able to look through that portfolio a year later, two years later, and see how much you've grown. And when you apply to jobs, you tell them, this is my work. What's gonna set you apart from someone else applying for this job that's been out five to seven years? Maybe they don't have a portfolio to show their work. Maybe you're an amazing general dentist when you're out of residency because your hand skills are superb and you're an artist, but the person hiring you doesn't know that. All they see is she went to school, she graduated after one year of residency. I'm sure they don't know much. But if you can show them what you can do, that'll set you apart. So start taking pictures, build a portfolio of your best work, and also understand that this is the time for you to practice. In school, you practice with faculty, and it's like if you make a mistake or something happens, you're not really concerned about it because you're protected by school. No big deal. Same thing with residency. That's why I don't recommend rushing out of it. Because once you're out there in the real world, no one's holding your hand. 
No one's taking the responsibility for you. If you mess up on a patient and the patient wants to sue you, you're getting sued. So basically the hand holding, I would take it as long as I can, which is why I decided to stay for a second year. Cause in my second year, I was able to do much bigger cases because I was taking so much CE. There were certain things that I knew more than the people in my residency, like the, the, te- the, re- the, the faculty and I was helped. We were all learning from each other. So the more that you can be in an environment where you can practice without the ability of having all that weight on your shoulders, I say, go for it. Even doing a second year, one year won't change your life in the grand scheme of how successful you are as a dentist. But imagine doing one more year of residency where you're doing full arch cases and you get to leave with that confidence. And now when you're applying to a job, it's like, hey, I know I'm a brand new dentist, but I can do full arch rehabilitation and I'm confident in it. So that confidence that you can gain in one year is much more valuable than being out in the real world and like making a dentist salary for a year. Because on, when you get out and you know more, you're gonna make more money anyway, if we wanna go down that route, which is a completely different conversation. All right, so I'm not even gonna to touch on this because it's too early. This is just one of those slides that you can take a screenshot of because this is courses to be taken after dental school, possibly in the start of residency. And we can have a whole entire hour long discussion just about the pros and cons of these courses. So I'm not even gonna get into it. Just take a screenshot. If anyone is interested, message me or email me separately. And we can always talk about this on a different um, Zoom. What I do wanna talk about is the CE that you could take right now. Right now, while you're home, while you're feeling like, oh my God, COVID, what is happening to my hand skills and blah, blah, blah. What we can do right now is learn photography because you don't need to be a professional. You don't need to be done with dental school to learn photography. We can work on our composite skills by doing something called hands-on live. I know that all of you guys have like a rotary situation set up at home because that's what I've heard from people. So you can sign up to this hands-on live course, which is very affordable. I think it's like $200. And again, email them, tell them you're a dental school student. And you can watch a video with some of the best dentists who are doing class four composites, composite veneers, masking dark tooth. I can tell you, I do this like once a month. I do this all the time. For me, it's fun. And I like to see different dentists way of how they do composite. My, my thing, which I tell everyone is if you can make a beautiful tooth out of composite, you can do anything. Composite is the hardest material to work with because we're not blobbing it on with our finger, right? There are so many techniques, so many ways you can make a tooth beautiful. So if you can make a beautiful tooth from nothing out of composite, you'll be able to do it with lux attempt, with any provisional material that you want. And when a person comes into your office, with a broken tooth to their root and their wedding is the next day and you don't have a wax up and you don't have a lab and you don't have anyone that can do it for you overnight, guess what? You're the hero. Because now you built this girl a beautiful tooth, her front tooth the day before her wedding, otherwise her life would have been ruined. And now you're the hero. So I'm all for a composite, figuring that out. Um, Wax up. I remember in dental school, I bought my own little wax up kit. You can get it on Amazon. And I would sit there like watching TV and practicing how to do the wax up. Because again, this is going to sharpen your hand skills for the same token, learning how to build teeth. We learn about the anatomy of the teeth in school all day long, but not, but you're not actually building it out. And when, when you're out of school, no one's testing you on, on the anatomy of school and test, they're testing how well you're going to do this in the mouth. So sharpening up the hand skills with the wax up and the hands on live course is something that I think is invaluable. And like I said, I literally do it all the time. Now, FMR via Zoom is not something that I recommend yet, but maybe in the beginning of residency towards the end or second year, I recommend doing FMR via Zoom. So I took this course in real life on Fridays at NYU where we had the lecture component and working on patients. Right now, Dr. Dean, who does this course, does a whole series for like the whole year on Fridays via Zoom. And I can tell you, I just did it again, the whole Zoom, this whole year of COVID on Fridays. And each time you learn something different because when you know more, you understand more of what's going on. The scariest thing about dentistry is when you don't know what you don't know, because then everything just go wrong and you have no idea why. But the more information that you have every time, even if it's the same speaker, every time they're talking, you pick up a different pearl because you have more of a basis of knowledge. So this is things that you could start doing now. Um, Starting building your social media presence is another thing that could be done now. Yes, you're in dental school, but so what? You can talk about, I know, for example, I just keep talking about Diana because her picture is literally right in front of my face, but she's always talking about what you guys are doing in school, her, the way that she's incorporating wellness, which I think is beautiful because it spreads the message. But 
you can figure out what you want to do in social media, whether you want it to be helpful to your peers, whether you want to start posting your cases. And regardless, you shouldn't be discouraged. Even if you're a dental student and you feel like it's not perfect, it doesn't matter. Because again, you will be able to see the evolution of everything that you're doing. Um, and any CE credit that you take now, by the way, even like the hands-on live and all that stuff, and you get CE credit as a resident and as a second year, all of that could be applied for your FAGD, which is something else that we can discuss. But by doing two years of residency and all these courses, I think you need 500 CE courses to apply for FAGD, but it's something that could be done as well. And doing a second year of GPR is something I recommend to everyone. This year will bring you much more confidence and nothing, nothing will change in the terms of like you getting ahead. All right, a few things about social media and then I promise we're going to be done. So it takes more than just teeth. I can tell you that from my own personal experience. Like I said, with my advice about applying to residency, about being yourself, I see the same thing with social media because I really truly believe that people are coming to the dentist for who you are as a person, more so than even the work. The work is a touch point. So if someone follows me on Instagram and they like the work, that is just a touch point, but that might not be all that's gonna reel them through the door. What might is me being myself, showing some aspect about myself, let it be, I don't know, the fact that I drink green juice every day. Maybe someone following me that's interested to go to the dentist drinks green juice every day too. And then the second their teeth hurt, their tooth's gonna hurt. And instead of going on Google, they're gonna be like, oh my God, that girl I follow, she drinks green juice every day, just like me, oh, just gonna go to that girl. And the truth of the matter is, that is really how patients think because they don't understand the intricate details of the work. They really, really don't. So I think it's important for you to be who you are in social media and don't look at other people's Instagrams and try to copy them. That person already exists. They are who they are and you are who you are. So there's no need to look at someone else's and think, oh, well, this person, they put teeth all down the row. So I should put teeth all down the row. Literally, none of that matters. But the most important thing is figure out what your Instagram is about. Is your Instagram for dentists? Because if your Instagram is for dentists and all you want to do is talk to other dentists about work, then yes, maybe all you're going to post about is teeth and nothing else. But if your Instagram is to get patients, completely different story. What are your focuses and what are your geared towards? Because if you're geared to trying to get patients through the door, just posting the teeth might not be enough. Maybe they're not interested in it. Maybe they want to go to someone that they connect with on a deeper level. So showing your personality and who you are is going to get them there. So I think that right now is a great time to start building a social media, but figure out the why. Why are we doing it? Do you want to be a dental educator? Is your goal in life to just be standing up on the podium and educating? So right now, what you want to do is connect with all the big educators and learn from them and show your work and discuss that? Possibly. And that's fine too. Just figure out why you're doing it before you start so that you're not confused and you understand the goal of the social media. And another thing is that right now, because of COVID and because you really can't go anywhere, um, Instagram is kind of like networking. So I decided to call it Insta working. It's kind of like virtual networking with dentists around. And that is literally how I ended up at the office where I am. So when I got sick, I told you guys that before that I was kind of in a situation where I was almost renting a chair with my patients. And then I had, I couldn't work. Who's going to see my patients? Again, another example of why teamwork is important because you do not know what's going to happen in life. I didn't expect to get sick. Didn't expect to take six months off. Well, where are my patients going to go? So that's why having a team is important. And I ended up becoming friends with Dr. Wong on Instagram. I loved her office. My Instagram was basically my resume because I had all cases up there all the time because I used to post way more teeth because I thought that's all I wanted to do. And she saw my work. I was like, this is what I can do. Came to the office, loved it. And that is how our union began. And I can't, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be a part of the team because like I said, in life, things happen. And if you're on your own and you don't have anyone supporting you, it's going to be very difficult when you're in a jam. And one day or another, unfortunately, something will happen where you need that other person's help. So right now with Instagram, it's a great tool for social media networking and putting your work out there. You can literally use your Instagram as your resume and portfolio. As crazy as it sounds, we're in an age where I think that that is completely valid and normal. And last but not least, finding your balance and you will find success so you can change the world. One smile at a time. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bridget, that was amazing. I want to start off first with some quotes that people have been texting me. Um, okay. I'm in tears. You don't know how much I needed to hear this today. I'm so happy she talked to us. 
God sent this woman to me. So you, this was an amazing presentation and thank you so much for giving it to us today with all of your wonderful advice, wellness, people, not patients, etc. So thank you. Thank you, um, thank you so much. Thank you. I received a few questions and as more questions come in, everyone, you can put them in the chat as well. The first question I wanted to ask, um, dental school environment can be toxic. I feel like some of my classmates complain to each other about who has it worst. I have to do all of this in preclinic and still study for the classes. And then you can realize how ahead someone is of you. How can I better filter these negative thoughts um, that I'm behind always and have a more positive outlook on school in general? I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I will say about the negative thoughts and the negative people around you is that once you start changing as a person and you start seeing the negative around you, I, I'm not saying to exclude these people from your life, but try to work on having them change their mindset too. Because once you see things differently and it's so clear, you can help the other person see that as well. So instead of complaining like, oh, well, I have it worse because I'm doing this, this, and this, and this person's doing it that it's easier for them, it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, who has it worse? Actually, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is how you feel about yourself. So instead of thinking, oh, but I'm in clinic and I'm blah, 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 why don't we reframe the mindset? Wow, look at all the things I could do. I can go to clinic and I can study for the test and I'm still doing well. She's not. She only has to do X and she's doing well too, but good for her. But look at me. I'm able to do both. I guess I'm really doing well. So just like reframing that picture and understanding it can make a huge difference. And there's really no need to compare one person's struggles to another, because even though that person, maybe it seems it's easier for them because they don't have preclinic and whatever, you don't know what's going on in their life. What if their life is super difficult because they have a sick family member? Can you compare with that? You can't. So we don't see the full picture of what's going on in a person's life. So just comparing these surface level situations doesn't really matter. Thank you. Um, these next two questions kind of go together. So I'm gonna combine them. Um, how much does GPA matter in getting a job? And if you didn't work as hard as you did in dental school and residency, do you think you would be as successful as you are now? So GPA does not matter when you get a job. It, I don't even think they look at it. Truly, I don't think the GPA matters at all. And I'll tell you why. Because let's say you're an amazing clinician and you have all the best grades in preclinic and you're, you're an artist, but you suck at studying. So your grades are horrible in all your classes, even though you have beautiful hands and you know the stuff, you're just a nervous test taker, so your grades aren't good. So either way, your GPA is down. Does that make you a bad dentist? It doesn't. And I can tell you that the person in the office who's hiring you, they don't care about your GPA because they're not going to give you tests while you're there. What they care about is truly what they care about is how are you going to treat their patients? Because when you come in as an associate, it's not your practice. Most of the time you're not bringing in patients. I have a very different scenario because I have always brought in patients, even now as an associate, I kind of like run my own marketing and do that kind of stuff. But when you brand new are going to work in someone's office, their office, it's their baby and it's their patients. And they are going to trust you with their patients. So why would they trust you? They'll trust you because they know you're a good person, that you care about their patient. Are you going to do right by their patient or are you going to diagnose a crown because you need to meet your goal for the day, even though you could have done a DO? So they don't care about your GPA. They care about who you are and how you're going to treat their patient because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. You're stepping in on their territory. And then the second part of the question was, do you think you would be successful as you are today? Um, so I think that basically in dental school, I did all these things and I'm not saying that I would not do them. I just don't think that the way that I did it in terms of like being up all night and all that stuff would have changed anything. Maybe I would have done a little bit worse on a test if I didn't stay up all night, but do I think that would have changed where I am today? No. And the reason I can say that with confidence is because all the dentistry confidence and skill that I got happened after dental school. It started by taking CE, by finding mentors in the people who are running the CE. Like for example, the FMR course, Dr. Dean, um, I showed a picture before with Dr. Adamo. I don't know if many of you know him, but he does a lot of courses on composite and photography and being around those people 
and in an environment with other like-minded people is what elevated me. Being a part of the AACD, AACD, seeing the beautiful work that people could do, that's what pushed me to be better. It didn't really matter what happened in school. I think that even if my grades were half of what they were, it really wouldn't have changed where I am today because the work that was put into getting here all happened after dental school, which is why I always say that this is a stepping stone to when you're gonna start your career when dental school is done. Thank you. And the last question I'm gonna take was also sent to me privately. Um, I think it sometimes takes huge life events to build perspective to a more happy and healthy life. What do you recommend for others to develop such perspective if they haven't gone through a huge life-changing event as you did? It's a good question. So I think it is harder, I would say for me personally, had I not gotten sick, would I probably still be running 100 miles an hour? Yes. But at the end of the day, no matter what, you will always hit the wall because it's there. So I'm not saying we need to sit and wait for something bad to happen for us to reframe our mindset, but the, the brain is a muscle. So we need to start training it by doing the little things like writing down your wins, taking that hour for yourself, understanding that you as a person have value aside from all your accomplishments in school and you know the running list. If you took all of that away, who are you as a person? Try to figure that out because that's something that I couldn't figure out when I was sick because when everything got taken away from me and I felt useless, I didn't know what to do with myself. So trying to just reframe that and figuring out who you are without it all, I think could be extremely helpful and incorporating these little mindfulness things will also start training the muscle to um, look at things from a different perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Bridget. Thank you so much for being here with us on your Sunday morning and sharing all of your infinite wisdom. Thank you guys so much for having me. I hope this was helpful. If anyone has any questions, I'm always available. I always answer everybody and um, I'm more than happy to help because I truly don't think I would be where I am today had it not been for my mentors and people supporting me. So I wanna be able to be that support for someone else too. Everyone's saying thank you in the chat, so. <laughs> I can't even pull it up. I'm so scared to touch the computer. I got it to this screen. I'm just like, hands off, so. Thank you guys so much for having me and um, I will talk to whoever soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Bridget. Bye. Thank you guys. So we are going to do our last breakout session quickly. Um, we're just gonna have four minutes in the rooms. Here are some of the questions that you can discuss and then we're gonna come back and wrap up this meeting.